Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, um, my great pleasure to welcome you to the Young Dementia Network Tea Time webinar, Connectivity Today. Um, I'm Tessa Guttridge, I'm chair of the Young Dementia Network. Um, as I mentioned, this month's focus is on the use of technology uh, and social media and um, uh, the use of technology and social media by people with young onset dementia. And today we've got uh, two experts with us, Catherine Talbot and Michael Andrews. I'm going to hand over to Catherine shortly, but I just wanted to remind you that um, attendees can't, cannot be seen or heard, um, but we very much encourage you to uh, use the chat and the, Q, the question uh, functions. Um, we usually have lively chat and that's really great to see. So, that, so please do go ahead with that. And, um, I'm handing over to Catherine now, thank you. Yeah, hello everyone. I'll just um, share my screen, just bear with me one moment. Okay, so hopefully you should all be able to see that now. Um, so yeah, uh, as Tessa said, um, I'm gonna be talking about dementia and digital technologies and social media today, sharing a bit of the research findings that I've been working on. Um, but I just wanted to start by really giving a little bit of a hello from me, really. So my name is Catherine Talbot and I'm a lecturer in psychology at Bournemouth University. I do research in cyber psychology, which is basically the psychology of how we interact with digital technologies. And my specialism is actually early stage dementia and digital technologies, with much of my work focusing on young onset dementia. And my PhD actually focused on how people with dementia use Twitter. So I guess you could say I'm a doctor of Twitter. Um, and, you know, if you do have Twitter, you can follow me at Catherine Tal, which is there. And also my email is there as well. And um, so, yeah, today I'm going to be speaking about some of the research that I've recently done that looks at how people with early stage dementia use digital technologies during the COVID-19 pandemic and also a little bit of my work that focused on social media as well. So let's make a start. And so as I'm sure you're all aware, during the COVID-19 pandemic, people with dementia, they were at risk of negative outcomes. So they were adversely affected by a disruption of routines, a lack of cognitive stimulation, um, reduced social interactions, and also there were reports of symptom progression as well during this time. And alongside this issue of symptom progression, another key concern was this issue of social connectedness and loneliness among people with dementia. And really, we saw these reports of surges in loneliness and isolation among this group during the pandemic. And this was due to not being able to see friends or family, but also having restricted access to support groups, to services, to activities, which we know are incredibly helpful in living with dementia. Um, but meanwhile, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw that these digital interactions, digital activities and digital spaces, they became incredibly important for many people and were in fact actually a lifeline during this very difficult time. And so I, I, I theorise that there really is a greater need to understand how people with dementia adapted to this new digital landscape and to also find out how digital technologies can be used or how they can be adapted to improve the lives of people with dementia. So in my research with Professor Pam Briggs at Northumbria University, we asked the research question, how did people with early stage dementia use digital technologies during the COVID-19 pandemic? And for this study, we interviewed 19 people with early stage dementia and these interviews, they were conducted on the telephone, they were conducted by Zoom or email. It really depended on the participants' preference because we wanted them to engage in the research however they felt more comfortable doing it, whatever their preference was. And just to note, our participants, they were relatively young, so the average age was 62 years old. And most of the participants were living with young onset dementia. And they were all living in the community, either independently or with family members. 
And these were our key findings. Um, so our findings showed that people with dementia, they were using technologies to assist with everyday life, to connect with others, and to create a sense of meaning during this very difficult time. And actually, the technologies also seem to have this secondary effect of providing cognitive stimulation during a time when actually it was quite difficult to stay cognitively stimulated. There were limited opportunities during the pandemic. And I just want to point out that although our study is small, I just want to say that the findings really do speak to the adaptability of people with early stage dementia, uh, certainly the people we spoke to, and their willingness to adapt and to engage and learn how to use digital technologies to meet their needs. But let's go into those findings in a little bit more detail. So we found that people with dementia, they use digital technologies to support them in everyday life to live more, to live more independently. So some people, they described using digital tools such as Google Maps to orient themselves when leaving the house. So for example, this participant who I've quoted here, they described an experience of suddenly feeling quite lost on a local walk. So they started to use Google Maps and take photographs of landmarks on their phones when they were going out on walks so that they could find their way again. And this meant that they could continue to engage with the outdoors and still maintain their independence as well. Participants in my research as well, they also often discuss using virtual assistants such as Alexa. So Alexa it can be programmed to remind you of appointments, to take medications, to make phone calls, all of these sorts of things which can be useful reminders to help you to remain independent at home. And also importantly, Alexa responds in quite a calm way as well. Um, it doesn't respond in a stressed or angry, annoyed or irritable way. And that's quite beneficial as well. And one thing I did want to highlight as well was this issue around online shopping during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the people we spoke with, they found grocery shopping to be very stressful during the early stages of the pandemic because many stores had abandoned their dementia friendly policies. Um, people weren't very kind. They were quite stressed out in the supermarkets as well. Um, that pe the people we spoke to would sometimes forget the new rules of the supermarket. Or, and in addition to that, they also feared of contracting COVID-19. So as a result, people with dementia, they turned to online shopping. And while some people were successful with that, there were a lot of cases where people actually weren't able to get a slot. Um, and this was in part due to people with dementia not being identified as vulnerable. So I just wanted to highlight this, that while having digital technologies is great and it is beneficial in theory, um, they're actually only effective to, in supporting people with dementia if they align with policy making as well. But we'll touch a bit more on that later. So to combat the feelings of isolation that people with dementia experience during the pandemic, they also turn to video calling software and social media to not only connect with friends and family, but also to connect with other people with dementia as well and access much needed peer support. And this included Facebook groups, it included Zoom calls with other people with dementia, um, Zoom support groups, and actually being able to connect with others with dementia was a lifeline for the people that we spoke to, and they often called it that. And that was because they could share their strategies on how to cope with the stresses of the pandemic with one another. And they could also speak um, quite openly about their dementia in a way that some felt they couldn't do with their family members whom they were stuck, stuck with inside their home. So it provided this really nice place to express themselves and how they were feeling. And from my experience of interviewing people with young onset dementia during this time, there was this real sense of community among the people with dementia who I spoke to. You know, as one participant says who I've quoted there, which I think is just a wonderful quote, we used to be united against dementia and now we're united against COVID-19. And I think that just really speaks to the power of peer support and its importance for people with young onset dementia. 
But one, one big issue for the people we spoke with was a loss of meaning and a, a loss of purpose during the pandemic. And this is where technologies were again, really, really helpful. So people with early stage dementia, they described using technologies for self-development or for skill development. So some people talked about using YouTube to learn new skills such as crafting. And this was really helpful because they could stop the videos when they wanted, they could rewind it if they wanted to, and they could take it at their own pace. And this actually made, made the classes a little bit more easier to follow. Um, some people also discussed attending remote classes via Zoom as well, such as poetry classes. And that was really helpful in occupying their time and having this sense of meaning and sense of purpose, which we know is so important for people with dementia. It's also worth noting as well that actually learning how to use technologies such as Zoom, such as Microsoft Teams, that was a skill in itself for some people. And it did, in fact, actually provide them with the sense of achievement as well, that they'd mastered a new technology such as Zoom or Microsoft Teams. And other participants as well that we spoke to, they reported using technologies to support their advocacy work. So fighting for the rights of people with dementia and challenging stigma and stereotypes and that again gave them this sense of purpose and a sense of meaning. So in reality, this looked like using video calling software to give talks, using social media to share their experiences, using smartphones, tablets or laptops again to stream, to stream into talks or blogging about their experiences and really challenging those stereotypes. But also others use social media and video calling software to help others with dementia as well, um, or to get involved in research. So there were these ways that they could use technologies to engage in activities and facilitate a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose during this very difficult time and to feel like they were still contributing to society, um, which we know is very important. And as I said earlier, a lot of my research has focused on Twitter specifically. Um, and just to give you a brief summary, I found that there really is this nice community of people who are affected by dementia on Twitter. And that includes carers and it includes people with dementia themselves. And in my work, I've identified several benefits through my interviews with people with young onset dementia. And we found that being a member of these online communities, it can be really helpful in combating the isolation and this initial sense of loss that accompanies the dementia diagnosis. Um, and that's because it provides opportunities for social connection and peer support by having access to people who face similar challenges online. And this support can some, quite often be lacking in their offline environments. So actually, Twitter is a really useful resource in this way. And um, importantly as well, we've also found that being a member of offline online communities can also impact offline social connections as well. So it can create opportunities to engage with certain activities. For example, the people we've spoken to have reported attending dementia group meetings, attending conferences, getting involved in research, all because they are active on Twitter. So some have mentioned that it really opens up this new world for them and provides a springboard for new activities. And it's also provided a space where people with dementia can express how they're feeling, um, which people with young onset dementia have said is quite therapeutic and actually quite empowering for them, you know, because they can communicate their own pace, they're not interrupted on Twitter, they can check the wording of their tweets, and often that space is separate from their friends and family, so they felt like they could express themselves a little bit more openly. And also what I think is really interesting, some of the people that I've spoken to have said that the character limit of tweets, which is 280 characters, um, was beneficial for them because it's short, it's sharp and it's to the point. And for the people I spoke to, that was a much more accessible way of expressing themselves. And also just to say that actually being active on social media and using digital technologies, um, just by doing that, people with young onset dementia, you're challenging the stereotypes and the stigma that surround dementia 
just by using these resources and really redefining what it means to be a person with dementia. And this representation on social media and other spaces, it can be really helpful for a lot of people, particularly for those who've recently been diagnosed. And it isn't just all about Twitter. There's lots of really useful social media resources available for people with young onset dementia. And it's really finding what works best for you. So there's private Facebook groups specifically for people with dementia. You just need to type in the search bar and ask to join. Um, there's also blogs written by people with dementia as well, which you might find inspiring or helpful to read or to get some top tips there as well. Or you could even create your own blog to document your experiences if that's something you're interested in. There's also online forums as well, which I'm actually exploring in some research I'm doing at the moment with a colleague. And we're finding that online forums seem to be a really valuable source of post-diagnostic support. And also there are more anonymous space as well compared to other types of social media. But I do just want to finish up by briefly discussing some of the challenges that are associated with social media in particular and other technologies. So in our research, we have found that using technologies such as video calling software, as I'm using now, it's actually quite cognitively demanding. And many people told us that after using Zoom quite intensely, um, they feel quite tired, they'll have headaches, or sometimes problems with concentration after using these technologies. Um, so therefore, it's important to take breaks where needed and perhaps limit usage and do what works best for you. Also, conversations via video calling software, people told us they can be quite difficult to manage sometimes um, because there isn't those non-verbal cues such as body contact, eye contact, gestures. Um, so it's really important to have clear rules when having group conversations in Zoom, in Zoom or with Microsoft Teams, you know, such as using the raise hand function or using I want to speak cards and inviting people into the conversation who perhaps haven't spoken yet um, to stop them from feeling excluded. So those are all things to keep in mind if you are running one of these Zoom sessions. Also, sometimes the symptoms of dementia, we were told, can make it difficult to use technologies, but there are creative ways to get around this. So, for example, one person who we spoke to, they were having difficulties with typing, um, but they wanted to continue to use technologies to stay connected with people that they've met online and other people with dementia. So instead, they used a speech to test to speech to text app. Um, so they would say what they wanted type, to be typed out loud, and then it would convert that into text, and then they would send it. And that was really important because it helped them to stay connected, even though they were experiencing these, these challenges, these barriers with their symptoms. And just finally, also remember that while I'm being very positive about the value of digital technologies and social media, not everyone is nice online and by identifying as a person living with dementia there are potentially some people who would try to take advantage of that and who can be quite convincing um, so there are some people who might try who who scam people online and just being aware that those people do exist and being quite critical if you receive a message from someone you don't recognize um, yeah, basically. And also there's trolls as well on social media or dementia doubters we found in our research who are people who doubt the diagnosis of people with dementia. My advice would be to block them straight away and just don't engage with those individuals. And also the people that we've spoke to, they've said they've expressed some difficulties actually remembering how to use digital technologies or even knowing how to use them in the first place. So you might, that's why I'm advocating for some training, um, evidence-based training on how to use digital technologies, how to get the most out of them. But you might also want to write down some notes on how to use um, certain technologies and that could be helpful for you. And also we need to remember that not everyone does have access to these digital technologies. Um, so therefore what I'm really advocating for in my research 
is that we need to have equal access to digital technologies and to digital learning opportunities so that everyone can benefit from them. And that's just a little wrap round of my talk. Um, if you are interested in engaging with any of my research, please feel free to drop me an email. I'm always keen to hear about people's experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you for that. And I think there's a few questions coming in, but we'll answer those at the end of the webinar. So, hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Kiley. I'm the Young Dementia Network Coordinator. Um, and we're now going to have a chat with Michael, who um, will explain a little bit about some of the amazing technology he uses and the gadgets he uses to allow him to, to live independently. So, Michael, welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Would you like to start by explaining a little bit about yourself? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael. Uh, I live in Bradford in Yorkshire. In June 2017, I got diagnosed with a rare form of dementia called posterior cortical atomy or PCA dementia. Uh, I was a long distance lorry driver. Of, I think of about 35 years driving trucks. Uh, so they actually took the license off me before I got diagnosed because a lot of it is eyesight problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, Michael, I know you had a, quite a long journey to diagnosis, didn't you? Um, so it's been quite a challenge for you um, to get your diagnosis. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about, about that, first of all? Yeah, it's, uh, it was a case of... Because I, I was young, the, the cap said to me, no, it's not dementia. Uh, and I kept getting passed from one department from the other. I was, mm. I, I started off with my GP and then it was the opticians and then back to the GP. And then uh, the GP, they had decided, we'll get in touch with a memory clinic. So then you're waiting for an appointment to see them. When I finally got an appointment, they done tests and they said, no, it's, it's not dementia. There is something going on, but it's not dementia. We'll do the, these tests. And then it was test after test. And then it was, uh, we're going to send you to the uh, neurology. So then you've got to wait on an appointment for that. You get into see neurology. Now, he actually confused me because he, he says, I'm going to do an MRI scan. Uh, went for the results and he says uh, the, the back of your brain is actually sh uh, showing shrinkage so the there is shrinkage at the back of your brain but there's nothing we can do I'm referring you back to the memory clinic so then I'm passed back but there was still no mention of dementia mm. and then the memory clinic kept saying to me no it's not dementia because your problem solving is excellent uh, some days you would do a memory test. Some days I was flying through it. Other days I was a wee bit, a bit slow at it. And they kept saying, well, that might be just anxiety or depression mm -hmm. because you're going through all this, but it's definitely not dementia. And then it was, we think it's eyesight problems, what's causing all this. So back to the hospital to, to do eyes. They don't test, and he, he actually says to me, uh, do you know, your, your eyesight's actually deteriorating, but yet your, your eyes are actually healthy. There's nothing wrong with your eyes. We're going to do tests, but you've got to go to the university for it. Uh, I think they called it an EEG. They put mm -hmm. strobes on you all over your head. Uh, went and done that, and they actually said, the eyes is picking up the signals, but the back of the brain, they're getting distorted. So the back of the brain isn't receiving the proper signals. So we're referring you back to the memory clinic. So back there again, more tests for this, more tests for that. And then it was, uh, I actually, uh, one of the, I actually got my hopes built up because it was a German doctor, a lovely woman, and she worked for the memory clinic and she come to the house and she says, oh, Michael, I know what's wrong with you. Uh, there's, I, I believe there's a blockage going into the brain. Uh, 
surgery will fix it. Uh, it. It entails removing a small piece of the skull and it'll open it all up. Now, the only people can do that's neurology. So I'm referring you back to neurology. So, it, uh, all right, I didn't want to have surgery, but I thought it, I'll get back to work. I'll get my life mm -hmm. back. Yeah. So back to neurology, and I've seen the same person would have told me there's a shrinkage at the back of the brain. And the first thing he says to me, no, she's talking nonsense. That, that's not going to fix you. I'm referring you back to the memory clinic. And then it, I think he actually gave up with me. He says, look, I don't like doing this, but he says it, it's because of the cost. It's too expensive, but I'm going to send you for a PET scan. Uh, done the PET scan, went in for the results. And to me, it, it was like been given a, a death sentence mm. because all that time they kept saying to me, it's not dementia. And I'll be the first to hold my hand up and say, I didn't actually know nothing about dementia. For me, dementia was an old person's thing mm -hmm. because everybody else was saying it. Yeah. And then to be told, I'm sorry to tell you, but you've got posterior cortical atomy, dementia. The first three words, posterior cortical atomy, I'd never heard of it. I hadn't a mm -hmm. clue what he was talking about. And then when he said dementia, I sort of thought, I could swear he's just said dementia. And then I thought, no, he's, he's wrong. And then after that, he's still talking. But to me, I could hear noise, but I couldn't understand what the words were. Yeah. Because it's still going through my head. He's just said dementia. Mm -hmm. And he, I know for definite, he did say to me seven years. Uh, I'll give you seven, seven years. And when I come out of there, I was... I was totally confused. I didn't know what was happening. There was an occupational therapist come and I said to her, what, what, what was it he told me I've got? And she had to go and get me all the details of it, all the leaflets on it. And I said to her, what does he mean by seven years? And she says, did he say the life expectancy is seven years or did he say until it's fully developed mm -hmm. the dementia I said I don't know he just said seven years and then she says are you sure he didn't say seven stages I says no I, I definitely heard seven years mm -hmm. but I didn't I wasn't taking it all in I just didn't know what he said yeah. so she said do you want me to find out and I says no don't because then I'm going to be counting down so yeah. every year I'm, I'm going to start counting so no I says no just forget about that you want to live your life yeah. 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 So, Michael, I know you attend a group in Bradford and I hear they have a, a nickname for you at that group and they call you the Gadget Man. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Well, they said if, if anybody wants to know about a gadget, ask Michael because yeah. he's got them all. <laughs> so you've got all the gadgets. So I know you live independently by yourself. Um, yeah. And the gadgets that you've got allow you to live alone. Um, and I know um, you've got your phone and your watch and your iPad. So would you tell us a little bit about how you use them, what you use them for, for connecting you and for your appointments? Yeah, well, the, the, the tablet's what I'm on now with this. Uh, the tablet then is automatically hooked onto my phone. And then my phone's hooked onto my watch. And then what happens is it, if I've get, got an appointment, I'll put it on the tablet, you know, because it's easier to type it out on the tablet because the yeah. keypad big so I can see it. And then it, it automatically puts it into the, the phone. Mm -hmm. But then what happens is because I'm going out, say I had a hospital appointment or something, I'll, I'll be in the town. If somebody talks to me, I'll forget about the appointment and then I would miss it. Mm -hmm. But now what happens is my watch starts fight. So my watch goes off maybe an hour, an hour and a half before my appointment. And then it just keeps vibrating and, and sending me messages up until I cancel it. Mm -hmm. So it means if, if I get distracted in the time, it's still going to keep, you know, my watch is still going to keep vibrating yeah. and telling me. And then I can, if I'm talking to somebody, oh, I'm sorry, I'll have to go. Yeah, it reminds me. I just keep doing that. And then when I get to the appointment, I just knock it off my watch. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. So you, you can never miss your appointments now. The watch is always telling you what you need to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, Michael, you, you're on your tablet for Zoom. Do you do you find you use Zoom a lot? Uh, is that something you, you're used to? I do. I do use it. I mean, before lockdown, I'd never heard of Zoom. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard of Zoom. I'd never heard of webinars. Uh, Microsoft Team. I, I, I just didn't know what they were. And when when the for, very first lockdown, I actually thought I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get through this mm -hmm. because I was always used to getting out. Yeah. I was one of them had to be out by meeting people mm -hmm. and going to groups, you know, support groups. And then all of a sudden, I was told, uh, well, one of the other reasons was because of, I'm still going through cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. So they said you're high vulnerable. You're not allowed to go out. And then people weren't allowed to come to visit me because I yeah. was classed as high risk. And I thought that I'm going to go do lolly. I'm going stir mm -hmm. crazy. And then all of a sudden, Zooms was coming up. Uh, now, I'll put my hand up. At the very start, it was a wee bit complicated, you know, working out how to hook on to them. And then yeah. you'd get Zoom. And then, say, another university wasn't using Zoom. They were using Microsoft Teams. And then you're having to adapt and change mm -hmm. everything. And then yeah. there was webinars, but then I absolutely loved it because it was it was actually keeping me going. Yeah. Uh, the, the one thing was before before the Zoom, they actually had to get me a speech therapist because I, I'd started to forget how to talk. Mm. They were living on my own and nobody coming out. I wasn't talking to nobody. Yeah. I'd got a phone call from somebody from the memory clinic and I couldn't I couldn't get the words out. I just couldn't pronounce the word. So they organized a speech therapist. Mm -hmm. And it was because I, it comes to this use it or lose it because I wasn't using it. So yeah. I was starting to lose it. Yeah. And then with Zoom, it actually brought all that back again. I was starting to get back to talking. Yeah, that's great gives you an opportunity to meet people connect with people over the calls yeah. and the video which is great um, and really important during that time as well when you weren't able to see people face to face to have that connection makes a huge difference yeah um and so michael i know that you tell me you have a kitchen full of gadgets and technology <laughs> to help you to live independently will you Tell us a little bit about some of the things you found that are helpful to you. Well, again, it's it's this case of use it or lose it. And I, I forgot how to use tin openers because you're not. I, I mean, I'm not one. I don't eat. I don't open tins every day. I don't eat tin food all the time. Mm -hmm. But it's just one. Now and again, I say I, I, I maybe have beans on toast, or I might have a, a tuna sandwich or something, or. And because I was buying stuff in bulk, you know, instead of buying one single tin of beans, I would buy a pack of four because it's cheaper. And I find a lot of them don't have ring pulls. Yeah. And then I, I was trying to open them and I thought this tin, I, I was blaming the tin openers because I, I couldn't understand it was me. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought the tin openers broke. So I would go out and I would, I would go and buy a more expensive one. And then the same again. I thought these tin openers aren't worth the money. They're they're all broke. And I'd go and get a, a more expensive one. And this was going on and on and on. And an occupational therapist had come out. And she looked in the kitchen drawer and she says, Michael, why, why have you got a kitchen drawer full of tin openers? And I says, because they're all broke. They can't be all broke. She says, let me see you opening a tin. And I, I tried to open the tin. She says, Michael, the tin opener isn't broke. She said, it's actually you. You forgot how to use a tin opener. Uh, and then she tried to show me, but then that was all right for the first couple of times. But then again, because you're not doing it all the time, it forgot again. Yeah. And then they, they come up with an, ele an electronic tin opener. Mm -hmm. uh, I've actually, I've actually got it here with an electronic one. So it's just a case of 
you set your tin in, push the handle down, the tin spins. And what it does is it, it actually takes the lid clean off. Mm. So you lift your tin off and the lid still, it's actually attached to this wee magnet. This wee magnet here, yeah. so the lid's still attached to that. And then it's a case of your tins open. But the good thing with this is on the top, because you come across jars and you can't get the lids off. Mm -hmm. So this actually has one of them grabs. That's brilliant. Uh, and all these are attached to it. And then on the bottom, you've got the, the bottle opener. You've got one for, say you have a bottle of water and you can't get the top off the bottle. So there's one there. Then there's, uh, if you get a ring pull on a tin and you can't get it open, you put that on there and then you, you just lift it. So it opens that tin. If you get something that's uh, got polythene, you know the way, the best example is a set of scissors. You buy a mm -hmm. pair of scissors and it's in that plastic stuff, you can't open it. But you need the scissor, you need a pair of scissors to get into it. Well, this actually has a, you put the corner of the, the packet in, you just run it up and it actually yeah. cuts the packet. That's an amazing gadget. It does many things all in one. Yeah, that's, that's I mean, it's, it's because, uh, again, if you're not opening tins every day, but you're not mm -hmm. going to forget because you just set the tin on and it, yeah. it, it, it takes over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and in, and in terms of cooking as well, and cooking for your yourself, you've got certain things that help you with that as well in the kitchen, haven't you? I have, yeah. Uh, there's a number of things that I use it. It's like a multi. It's actually a pressure cooker, a slow cooker, uh, a an air fryer. It's all in one. Uh, because I do, I well, not during, not when it's good weather. In the winter, I do a terrible lot of uh, stews and, mm -hmm. and broths and stuff. Well, I always do them in the slow cooker mm -hmm. because it's a case of you just prepare your vegetables. Uh, it's even got a, a sauté button on it, so you can sauté your meat and your onions, and then basically add your stock and then put it on slow cook. And the good thing is, if you forget about it, it switches itself off. So you're not, yeah. you know, you're not going to burn it. Yeah. So easier than the hob where yeah. you could leave yeah. it on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know people would say a pressure cooker is a bit dangerous, mm -hmm. but it's actually got a, a safety device. So it tells you how much water to put in. If anything goes wrong, it shuts down. Mm hmm that's good. You yeah. know, so it's it's not going to explode because yeah. you, you've heard them cases of pressure cookers mm -hmm. being dangerous. Yeah. Well, it, this actually just shuts down. Mm. Yeah, that's good. Uh, the, the thing is, saying that, I can't actually tell you if it works because it, <laughs> it's never happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> you've never had to use the safety feature. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I... Uh, there's there's also something else I use. A lot of people's never heard of it. Sous vide machine. Mm. Uh, it looks like a long tube, mm. and it you cook everything under vacuum. Well, I think that's what mm. sous vide is. It's French okay. for vacuum. Oh, okay. So you you vacuum seal all your you say you're doing a chicken breast or something. Mm -hmm. Will you prepare it now? I'll be honest, I, I like to use uh, Philadelphia cheese, we slice mm. it and then pack it with Philadelphia cheese, put it in the uh, the vacuum vacuum bag and then vacuum seal it. And then you put, it's like a water bath, you put it in a water bath, mm -hmm. so there's no water can get out of it. Uh, you put this, this tube in and then you set it for the temperature and how long you want it to run for. Mm -hmm. And then you just leave it and it does it all for you. That's great. Sounds great. Sounds like you're quite a chef. I, I must admit it, it's the juiciest chicken. And mm. if you do meat or chicken in it, it's, it's the juiciest chicken or meat you'll ever get. 
we're all going to be hungry now listening to all these <laughs> delights that you cook up in your kitchen with these gadgets it's amazing there, there, there is a lot of people that's never heard of them no a lot of people's never seen them and so michael how do you find out about them uh <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be honest, I, I find out a, about a lot of stuff through YouTube. Mm, yeah. I, I am absolutely fascinated with YouTube. They, mm. I mean, if, if I come across something and I can't work out how to, how to use it, yeah. YouTube's my backup, straight yeah. on to YouTube. Mm -hmm. Because there's there's that many people out there who shows you how to do something or how to fix something. Or... Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. You can find a video for everything on there, can't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's actually the same dementia. If, if you want to find out about dementia, you go mm -hmm. on YouTube, and there's that many universities has got a lecture going on about it. And... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you can use it for your own education as well as learning about your gadgets and technology. And yeah, it's a very useful yeah. uh, tool, but, isn't it, YouTube? But it, it's it's my lifesaver because. Uh, uh, I wouldn't say I play it. I'd say I make a racket with it. I've got a flute and an accordion. Mm -hmm. Now, before dementia, I used to be able to read music. And now I can't read music. Mm -hmm. So I've got to play everything the year. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll go on YouTube and listen to some traditional Irish music or folk mm -hmm. music. Yeah. And then I'll think that, that would sound good on the accordion or that would mm -hmm. sound good on the flute. And then I'll go back to YouTube and see about what's the fingering for it. Yeah. Because they'll show you what thing, you know, what keys to use mm -hmm. to start off with. And then once you get that, I'll keep going until I've got the tune. So that's YouTube's amazing. actually teaching me how to play certain tunes. Yeah, that's a that's a brilliant idea for YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Um and um Michael, you also have um various other gadgets. Um, I know you have a chessboard, an electronic chessboard. I do, yeah. You to play chess. Tell us a bit about that one. Uh, well, I, I always played chess, but because it was long distance lorry driving, the chess boards were always small, way electronic ones. And then with the PCA, it meant I couldn't distinguish what pieces were. You know, so a, a rook and a, a queen and a, uh, the king all looked the same to me. The, the only one I could work out was the knights. Mm -hmm. The rest of them all looked the same. So I yeah. couldn't work out what my pieces were. And then I give it up. But I, I still love chess. And then, well, you can blame YouTube again because <laughs> I, come, I went in to see if there was any, any way of, you know, getting back to an electronic chess, but on full-size boards. Yeah. And then everybody kept, they kept mentioning this company here, DDG, DDG electronic uh, chess board. And it's actually made by the, it's made by the company who does the, the, uh, the stuff for chess for the, the uh, tournaments. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Masters yeah. tournaments, uh, they make all the clocks and stuff for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually got it off Amazon. So I went on Amazon. Now, the funny thing is they are expensive, but I didn't actually pay the full price because I got a lot of vouchers from universities on Amazon vouchers, you know, for doing... Mm -hmm. research with them so I used the voucher so I don't oh, need to put a couple, of, a couple of pounds that's to it. great so I got, yeah I got the chess board but they they're actual full-size pieces so I, I can sit at night for a couple of hours and just play chess mind you I've never beaten it yet and I've got it <laughs> I've got it on the lowest setting but it I mean I'm I'm not I'm not a chess master it just puts puts an hour or two in of enjoyment yeah, absolutely Absolutely. And it's great that you can play um, at home and yeah, and use that chessboard as you love doing before. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Um, so Michael, we've just got a couple more minutes and then we'll go into some Q&A. Um, so I just wanted to, to ask you about, you know, all of these technologies that you use. And I think you told me this, you know, really your aim with all of this is just to allow you to live independently for as long as possible. 
And, and well, do you feel that you can do that with all of these things that you have? I, I do. I, I, I'll give you an example is, is uh, medication. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I call it a flat saucer. It's, it's this. <laughs> for, my tab, for me, tablets. I was, they, they did have it on Dasset Packs. You know, where you just pull the thing up and then yeah. you take your tablets. But mm -hmm. I find, for some reason, I was okay in the mornings mm -hmm. because of two times of eight o'clock in the morning and eight o'clock at night. Eight o'clock in the mornings, I seemed to be fine with that. Eight o'clock at night, I was just missing them. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if I was too involved with the TV or I was, you know, maybe tired, but I, I just couldn't take the tablets at night. And then the they kept saying to me, look, you must take, you can't miss them tablets. If you can't work out a way of, of taking your tablets, somebody's going to have to come in and give you the tablets. Mm. And then I thought, but wait a minute, then you're taking away a part of my independence. Yeah. And then it was the OT. She started looking into it. And it was actually the council in Bradford. They have an organization where they lease them out. And I want to say <laughs> lease, you don't, you, don't, you don't pay for it. Yeah. You know, so he comes out and he assesses you. And then he'll, he'll say, oh, yes, yes. Uh, I think one of those would help you. But the only thing you have to do is you have to organize your own chemist to, mm -hmm. or pharmacist to put the tablets in the trays. Oh, that's good that they do that. Yeah. Yep. So that's... Uh, I'll not take the lid off because all the tablets are going <laughs> to pop out. But that, that's the tray. And then all it is, you just lift the lid and pop the tray in. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And then it starts off. It starts off. There's no tablets in the one with a red mark. Mm -hmm. And then at eight o'clock in the morning, it turns around to the full one. And then it stays there until eight o'clock at night. And then it just keeps it just keeps yeah. turning. To give you so your medication, we, yeah. Yeah. At the right time. The, the only trouble is uh, it, see, it never shuts up. <laughs> There's an alarm goes on, and this wee red light starts flashing. And it just keeps going on and on until you lift it up and, and tip it upside down. And take the medication out. And, and once yeah. it gives you the medication, then it shuts up. <laughs> so there's no getting away from it. You've got to take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, to me, that... That was definitely to keep me independent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Michael, for sharing so much with us today. It's been really useful. And we have a few questions. So I'll just have a look here at the Q&A. Um, so let's have a look and see what we've got here in our chat. Um, so I think the first one was probably maybe Catherine could answer this one. Um, so who teaches Twitter for somebody who struggles with comprehension and I think you did touch on this a little bit. Ah, very good question. Um, so this is something I'm looking to get involved with research-wise, so watch this space um, and if there's any funders out there. Mm -hmm. But also mm -hmm. in my experience the people I've spoken to it's often been people from dementia groups who have supported people to use Twitter, so the people who actually run these groups um, otherwise, friends and family, someone that you know you can trust and who's mm -hmm. patient and will sit there with you and actually go through it and, you know, have, have a go with it once you've got that initial initial setup. Just have a go, have a play around with it, see what works for you as well. And, you know, perhaps also, as Michael said, have, have a look on YouTube as well, see if there's <laughs> any guides on there on how to use it. Um, yeah. That would be my advice. Thank you. Um, and then, Michael, we had a question about um, the gadget you use for opening um, on your attached to your uh, tin opener. There was a gadget at the bottom that you said could be used for opening packets. What, what do you do? You know the name of that gadget or the the name of the whole thing? The tin opener and the gadget. Uh, it's it's basically from that company murphy richards oh okay so it's from them okay and it's at the bottom of it that's clever yeah and it, it just it just sort of pulls out you just yeah so I, it's, I, it's actually it, it's actually in the the tin opener it's very useful that it's all together isn't it all in one place it is, yeah 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 
That's great. Okay, great. Murphy Richards. Hopefully that will help. We can somebody can Google it and find it. Um, and then also, um, Michael, have you tried coloured keys for your accordion and coloured notation books? Have you tried those? Were they any good? Uh, I'll, I'll be honest. The the accordion I have, it's it's a full size button key. It's not a piano key. Yeah. So it's it's chromatic button key. So there's there's over ninety keys on it. Mm -hmm. And the bass side, there's there's 120 keys. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, and the way it works is your your white uh, your black keys is the same as your piano. Mm -hmm. Your black keys is your sharps and your flats. Yeah. But they don't run like a piano. You know the way a mm -hmm. piano, they'll run down. Mine yes. mine goes across. Yeah. Yeah. So perhaps doesn't work. And is is accordion something you've been playing for a very long time? uh since i was at school <laughs> wow okay so yeah it's a lifelong hobby for you that's yeah. great that you can still play it yeah really good um and then just a question here about your your glasses michael are they for your to help with your vision they, they are yeah, yeah yeah uh these these ones are actually reading glasses because i'm close enough to the mm -hmm. computer but uh, I've got to wear glasses all the time. So I've my distance glasses when I'm out and about. I've then got a a gadget to help me. There's another another gadget. <laughs> now this like this was actually given them from the blind center. Oh, okay. Uh, you just flick. Oh, where is it? If, yeah, flick. You flick the back, and wee legs come out. Mm -hmm. And then when you switch it on, there's three lights comes on. Mm -hmm. So if you're reading a book, uh, now for me, I I can't actually see. I can't. That's a poetry book, and yeah. for me, I can't see that. Mm -hmm. But I, if I put that there on it, it oh magnifies. yeah, look at that! So it magnifies it. That's great. And then you can also uh, change. If I can find the button, yep. Oh, that's great. So you, you can keep changing it. So, so you can find the way that you, to, to get it yeah. to the setting that you want. Yeah. That's very clever. Uh, it actually cha it changes the color. Mm -hmm. So uh, with PCA, a lot of times, letters sort of jump over the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, somebody says to me, it's it's like a form of dyslexia. Mm -hmm. But what happens with this is you can change the color of the page. So I can have a yellow page with blue writing, or I can have mm -hmm. blue writing and a yellow page. Yeah. So I can totally change the contrast of the of the uh, paper. But also, if I'm out, if I'm outside, you can see I've got a lanyard on it. Yeah. If I'm outside and say there's stuff in the shops and it's up here, if mm -hmm. I can put it up, do that, and it takes a photograph of it. Yeah, that's really good. So, so then you can, can have a look at it. I can actually magnify the photograph. That's so brilliant. It can see, but it, it comes in handy. Again, if we go back to tins or packets, mm -hmm. is looking at the times, you know, how, how long yeah. do you cook it for? Yeah. Because there's no way in this earth I, I can could read them. read that because it's so small. Yeah, so it's really handy for that. Yeah. But, yeah. And um, one more question for you, Michael. Do you have any technology for home security? Is there anything you use uh, at home? Uh, it's, it, it comes back to my watch again. Mm. Uh, because of a fall. Yeah. If I have a fall, this sends a signal. Well, oh, it's good. not the, the watch sends it. The, my phone actually sends a message out to whoever's mm -hmm. I've put in as my emergency backup. Yeah. So if I fall, you know, say I have a trip and I fall. Mm -hmm. it, but what it does is it doesn't automatically send the signal. It'll give me so many, you know, so yeah. many seconds to deactivate yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Because, it, I mean, how many times are you going to pick something up and you've dropped it? Yeah, yeah. 
And I, I don't want to be getting people, you know, getting messages sent out for nothing. So <laughs> you just dropped it on the floor. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're trying to desperately hit the button to stop the message being sent. <laughs> yeah. And then plus it, there is that thing on it. If you get out and you get lost, mm -hmm. uh, you can actually activate it. And it sends a, it sends a, like a distress signal, yeah. like, you know, of your, where you're, I think it doesn't send, a map, I think it sends bearings out, you know, mm -hmm. your grid reference. Yeah. So somebody can come and help find you if you are lost. Yeah, yeah that sounds super. Well, thank you very much. Let me just see if there's anything else. I don't think I see any other questions. Um, Catherine or Michael, do you have anything else you want to add? Can I ask Michael a question? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, Michael, what advice would you give to a person with dementia who's perhaps a little bit nervous about using technology or new gadgets? Uh, I, I'll be honest. I, I don't go out of my way just to buy a gadget because it, it does something. Mm -hmm. I'll only buy a gadget as a last resort because yeah. I, I'm a strong believer in you've got to do the stuff yourself before you forget how to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll only I'll only do gadgets as a last resort, but it, it's saying that I've bought gadgets what didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. But it's a case of it's trial and error. You've just got to keep. Yeah. If, if you get something and it's not working, just don't give up. Mm -hmm. There's there's got to be something else out there that is going to work. Yeah, excellent. I think that's really good advice. I think you know to keep trying and you know like you said it's the last resort it's when you need a solution for something that's yep. when you'll look at uh, getting a gadget or seeing what's out there to help you yeah 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 well I, I certainly think uh, we all know where to come for advice when <laughs> we need some information about a particular gadget because yeah you definitely have that you deserve the title of the gadget man as they they say in Bradford <laughs> <laughs> it's really good well, thank you, both of you. It's been excellent listening to you today. And we have Tessa back now. Yes, and I'm going to second that. Um, the, it's, it's so important, isn't it? It's, it's proven itself to be so important over the last um, several years. And Catherine's research is just going to be uh, so essential going forward because the, the more that we can... You mentioned equal access to digital technology uh, and... and and the sort of um, access to the learning as well. And that's going to be important to, for people to stay independent and maintain their connections and, mm -hmm. and such like. And um, Michael, you, you have amazing determination to, mm -hmm. to um, try, try out all these things, as you say, trial, trial and error, and, and you found things that really work for you. And, and make an, a difference to your life. And I just, honestly, I, I just have every respect for you, for what, what, you're, um, what you're, you're doing and then mm -hmm. sharing, sharing with us as well, sharing yeah, your well, learning. The, the thing is that I'm one of these, I don't like people doing things for me. And I, I, can't, I can't be doing with people coming in to do stuff because yeah. to me that, that's taken away what I, that's taken away a part of me. Yeah, yeah. You know what was really interesting to find out the uh, bits of help that came from a speech and language therapist or an OT or a pharmacist that you can draw on, but then you carry on your own independent way. But you, you know what I mean? Being able to draw on the, their expertise, their help and such like, and then, and then you crack on with it. And, um, it, it it's in, inspirational. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Well, I, I, I always say, I know I, I keep boasting on about trying to keep me independent, but I still can't do it without some sort of support. Mm -hmm. I, I still need a backup because there is days things don't just don't come to plan, things don't yeah. work. And I, I like somebody to be there where who I can go to to have a talk with or, yeah. or, tr mm -hmm. or, or two heads is better than one. So both of yeah. us can come up with a solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, um, before we close, I'm just going to mention that there'll be a follow up email um, with the uh, recording of the webinar. And there's some useful uh, tips and uh, links in the chat. So we'll make sure that you yeah. receive those as well. 
for the various gadgets um, that uh, Michael's mentioned. And um, then we have the next uh, Tea Time webinar, which is going to be on the 22nd of June. Um, so that's just slightly different um, in terms of timing in the month for us, but it's going to be the 22nd and it's on community. That's around the importance of support and connection for family members of people with young onset. And that, that's going to be presented by Tide, Sarah Merriman and um, some family members. So we're very much looking forward to that. But for today, thank you so much. Uh, special thanks to Michael and Catherine and for Catherine for, the, um, for, for engaging in the conversation with Michael, which was great drawing out all those gadgets um, <laughs> and thank you very much for attending everybody so we'll just close for now thank you thank you thanks everybody thank you michael and catherine thank you bye everyone bye bye now bye bye, bye.